I don't know. I don't know how to check this, but uh, that seems it. No. No, 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 no. <laughs> As any parent will tell you, one of the very first lessons we try to drum into our... As any parent will tell you, one of the very first lessons that we try to drum into our objectionable offspring is the fact that actions have consequences. You don't need to drum that into them. It's like, literally, my kids touched the stove the other day. He's like two years old. Uh, you know, you, you're cooking, you're trying to keep him away, and he's, I'm like, don't touch that pad. Don't touch that pad. And he touches the pad, he's like, ah! and I'm like, that is of the consequences of your actions. I feel that's not something, I mean, you need to teach it, but mostly it's just learned. Unfortunately, even as adults, it's not always immediately obvious what these consequences might be. Yeah, just like the consequence of touching the pan was not obvious to my two-year-old, but the good news is you're not two. I don't think. You shouldn't be watching this if you're two. If you're wondering what the fuck's going on and you're new here, welcome, welcome. You know more than I do. <laughs> what are we talking about today? I don't actually know. I did read the title. You're probably not new here, but if you are, Dave wrote this. I'm reading it. This is what we do here. It's got to like react to this. You, you, you know the score. Let's go. One particularly fine example of this occurred when my older brother and I were playing around in my dad's workshop. My brother had been told that if you were to combine bleach and brake fluid, it would result in an awesome cloud of smoke. Unfortunately, and almost fatally, whoever had imparted this particular piece of wisdom had left out an important fact. That's going to be um, chlorine gas, isn't it? You've just made chlorine. You're going to poison yourself like the men in the trenches, bruh. Yes, science! Ah, uh, yes, that gas would be chlorine gas. My, had my dad not happened to come out from under the car he was working on and seen what we'd done and dragged us out into the street, we may have been in serious medical trouble. Yes, you would have been. That's what chlorine f gas does to people. Doesn't it, like, it just ruins your lungs? We were still in trouble, just the kind where your lungs stay on the inside. While this basic misunderstanding of chemistry may have had the potential to seriously injure a workshop full of people, there are many examples of unintended consequences which have much more wide-reaching ramifications. I'd say that's a pretty serious one, Dave. That ain't my touching the stove example. You made chlorine gas. Uh, I would like to... I would, I would like to be a, a terrorist. <laughs> Hello everybody, have you ever found yourself in the age-old dilemma? Boxers too loose, briefs too tight? Well, worry no more, because today's sponsor, Sheath, have got your back. Or should I say not your back, but your nether regions. I'm currently wearing Sheath right now. I've also got a nice clean pair of Sheath right here, and it's incredible. No more discomfort, no more awkward adjustments, just pure comfort. Whether it's hot outside, cold outside, whether you're in the gym, whether you're just sitting at a desk, no one likes the underwear that's like moving around and getting all uncomfortable, like riding up or, you know, it's not right. None of that with Sheath, which keeps everything exactly where it's supposed to be. They have this dual pouch system, so your uh, different man bits can go in different sections, which keeps everything like, especially in the summer, this is really good. Way less sweaty. Very nice. But I was skeptical at first. Who wouldn't be? Why? <laughs> You put your different pieces in different pe places? Bit weird. Try sheath, get one bare, you'll see what it's about, and then your entire underworld drawer will now be filled with sheath, like, in no time at all. It's just how it works. That's mine. It's just only sheath now. If you don't feel like wearing the, using the dual pouch system that day, no problem. You don't have to. They're still extremely comfortable. Plus, they have base layers for the winter. They've even got a brand new women's line, which is cool, made out of bamboo. Plus, Sheath are now the official underwear sponsors of the UFC. Head over to sheathunderwear.com and treat yourself. Use the promo code BLAZE for an exclusive 20% off. That's sheathunderwear.com. Promo code BLAZE. Your nether regions will thank you. And now back to today's video. In today's episode, oh, we're going to take a look at some of them. Stranger Danger. Sticking with childhood for a moment, it turns out that the Stranger Danger campaign, which was prevalent in the UK, I've got no idea how it caught on in the rest of the world. I feel like everyone has this nowadays, right? In America, you've got this as well. We have your son. Wire $20,000 to this account or else. Can I have a discount? You may not actually have improved the safety of children at all, so why not? Really? I don't know, I feel like teaching my kids not to like... 
I, it's a problem because most strangers are just, I'm sure they're just nice. But then you get like one in a million who's like gonna capture you and put you in your basement. Well, there are two main reasons. Firstly, according to children's charity kidpower.org, teaching kids that the world is full of evil people that they don't know called strangers does not make them safer. It just makes them scared. Nothing wrong with a little bit of fear though, is there? In fact, if kids do not know if they can get help from strangers in an emergency, then they could be even more vulnerable to harm. Some have died in situations where strangers could have helped. If you think about this for a moment, it's probably true. A child who has become separated from whoever is supposed to be looking after them at the time is probably going to be fairly scared as it is. If you add into that mix extra fear that at any moment they might be bundled into the back of a white van by any of the people around them that they've never met, a fear that we are encouraged to instill in our children these days, the likelihood of them approaching one of these people and asking for help is, I would think, negligible. I am always just like, well, just ask someone in a position of authority. If you're in a shop, ask the attendant or ask someone who works there. If you're on the street, ask anyone who's wearing a f- uniform. Like, and if there's no one else around, sure, ask a stranger. But doesn't it make sense to just always tell, you know, ask about, uh, ask people with uniforms? <laughs> it's anyone. <laughs> and if you're thinking about capturing children, just wear a uniform. Easy. What am I doing? <laughs> You are a babbling fool, and we have built a temple to madness. With regards to my own child, my wife and I have always told him that, should he become separated from us, he should attempt to find a mum with children and ask her for help. That's also a good one. For some reason, we arbitrarily believe that this is the safest option. As the second point, the vast majority of children who come to any kind of sinister harm do so at the hands of somebody they know, so completely avoiding any kind of stranger is, at least mathematically, unlikely to enhance their chances of survival. Unfortunately, it goes even further than that. So it does, does it, Dave? Tell us more. Due to the fact that very few of us adequately discuss the potential dangers of those people familiar to us, not only is a child likely to see anything that happens to them as normal, even if they don't, they could possibly they couldn't possibly tell anyone outside of the family about it because, as we all know, all strangers are dangerous. Oh my god, that's a conundrum, isn't it? Just so you're like, everyone's dangerous. Trust no one. Don't trust me. Don't trust your mom. Don't trust strangers. Just be alone. Yeah, so uh so monsters. <clears throat> monsters, they run wild here. Are you staying safe? It's kind of what but what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? How do we prevent any harm coming to children? I genuinely want to know. I'm not for a moment suggesting that it's a bad idea to warn your child against getting into a car on the street with somebody they've never met before. That's a terrible idea. But in my opinion, at least, it's a much better idea to teach your child to look out for suspicious behavior rather than branding everyone that they've never met as a potential sex offender or murderer. As a final point, and this is very much anecdotal as opposed to something I found actually reputable studies to back up, for those of us who are, shall we say, less inclined to socialize outside of our family unit, that fear of strangers really does appear to stay with us into adulthood, which can lead to genuine issues with making friends in later life. And good news is, when you get into later life, you don't have to make any friends! Or is that just me? Um, one thing I found super interesting... Uh, was like a piece of advice because like, I'll go to the park with my kid, right? Especially when they're a little bit younger, they would not want to leave the park. So they'd be like, okay, at some point we gotta leave. And I just know... And it's like, oh, try all the little tricks, tell them it's like the one last thing, bribe them, whatever. Just, no, nothing was more important to my kid than just staying in the park. So at some point, it's like, I've got to grab the kids, basically put them in the push chair, stroller for you Americans, and strap them in against their will. And they're like screaming and fighting, and it's like a crowd full of people. And I'm just like, and now we're going home. And it's like, I'm sure I've seen that happen, but it's like, isn't that what the kid would be doing if I was a stranger and I was kidnapping them? I had a great piece of advice to teach your kids. My kid was too young at that point. But the thing to shout for kids is, you're not my dad or you're not my mum. Because then someone's going to be like, bro, what the f*** are you doing? Is this your kid? And they'd be like, yes, it's my kid. It's my kid. And I'd be like, look, I'm just going to just gonna call the police just because your kid's screaming that you're not his dad. And I just want to make sure. <laughs> and if this happened to me, and like my kid did this for whatever f-ed up reason, I'd be like, thank you. We'll wait for the police. We'll show them it's my kid. And I'll be, f- and I will shake your hand because that is exactly the sort of person I want out there watching out for shit like this. Because that's good. Shit. 
whoever that random person that I made up is. Let's carry on. Macquarie Island. Macquarie? Macquarie? Who gives a f- island? Full disclosure, I borrowed the idea for this entry from Young Simon. Way back in history, nearly five years ago to be precise. <laughs> I don't remember this at all. Macquarie Island was featured as a part of a Top 10s video. Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Top 10's Net, and in the video today, the top 10 fascinating examples of unintended consequences. Number 10. Macquarie Island Located in the vast expanse of almost entirely empty ocean between Australia and Antarctica, Macquarie Island... So, what was the deal? The island in question, located about halfway between Australia and Antarctica, is one of the most remote locations on the planet I remember absolutely nothing about. It was five years ago. Who the f*** remembers anything from five years ago? That was 2019! My kid wasn't even born! The first one! So much so, in fact, that it wasn't actually discovered until around 1810. Fascinating, Dave. When it was discovered, the only things that appeared to live there were a lot of seabirds, fur seals, and penguins. Wait, was this the one that was, like, stripped for all of its, uh, nitrogen or something? From the bird sh- and then they used it for fertilizer? No. I don't think so. That wasn't near the Arctic, was it? That was some other random remote island that just got completely destroyed. If it were not for the abundant wildlife, the island would most likely have been left to its own devices, as the Asiatic Journal and Monthly Register for British India and its dependencies <laughs> put it. Nothing could warrant any civilized creature living on such a spot were it not for the certainty of industry being handsomely rewarded. You can tell that that's an old journal because they talk about, like, British dependencies. What the hell is even that? I don't think we have any of those anymore. <laughs> They're all very independent. I think there are some. Aren't there some, like, random islands and sh but it just reads old. When humans arrived to hunt the penguins and the seals, they brought along with them, purely by accident, rats and mice. Given the gestation period of your average mouse is just under three weeks, and rats can give birth four times in three months. Jesus! Those are busy if rabbits. It's all about rats! These rodents quickly became a problem for anybody interested in eating any meals that did not contain rat or mouse. The solution, it appeared, at the time... Oh, I know this! They bring loads of cats! The cats onto the island! I remember this now! Why not bring along some cats? Yes! Five years ago, thousands of videos. I still now I remember the thing about the cats. And they f*** everything up. Although the cats certainly did help with the rodent infestation, cats are, at heart, ass. Unlike dogs, you could be trained to only kill certain things. Cats will just kill everything. Hey. What the f hey! Unfortunately for the ecology of the island, this quickly included most of the bird population. Because humans have a tendency to not learn anything ever, in 1870, seal hunters had another idea. <laughs> Are they going to bring something to kill the cats? You're just going to go onto some cycle and then the island's just going to be filled with, like lions or something eating each other why not bring along some rabbits as well after all rabbits are allegedly tasty yeah i'm not a big fan of rabbits i don't think it's particularly good and also famous for their ability to quickly make more rabbits in 1985 it was finally decided that the cats had to go and, <laughs> and after a cull that lasted nearly 15 years how many cats were there. The last of these murderous vermin have been exterminated. Unfortunately, if anything, this made the rabbit population worse, and they quickly... <laughs> they consumed 40% of all the plant life. So you release the cats, the cats eat all the animals, and then you're like, okay, f*** it, we'll kill all the cats and put some rabbits there. Wait, why did they put the f***ing rabbits there? Oh, for, like, food for the people. The rabbits just eat all the... Na <laughs> There's nothing left. This island's it would not be until 2014, 14 years after the eradication of the last cat, that the island would be declared pest-free. As the place is now a natural heritage site, hopefully it may eventually fully recover from the effects of humans that don't know what they're doing. Um, wait! This actually sounds like it all worked out, so now it's just an island full of rabbits? That sounds good. I mean, not good. I don't like rabbits, but people like eating rabbit. People must love this shit. Congratulations! Humanity, humanity you did it! 20 Fenchurch Street. I just literally made a video about this yesterday. This is the walkie-talkie, the skyscraper that was destroying cars. Let's get into it, because there's nothing like a bit of repetition. 
England has a bit of a knack for buildings that are not entirely fit for purpose. For example, the city of Portsmouth built an insanely expensive commemorative tower to mark the beginning of the new millennium. Well, it was supposed to mark the beginning of the new millennium, but the contractors appeared to be using a different calendar than the rest of the world. Because of this, it didn't open until 2005. Bruh! <laughs> it's, it's really late. I visited this 165-meter monstrosity on two occasions. On both occasions, all of the lifts were out of commission and I was forced to walk up each and every one of the 563 stairs of the viewing deck. As regular viewers will no doubt appreciate, I gained very little enjoyment from this viewing platform. And for non-regular viewers, Dave, why did you do this? You climbed up the top to a viewing platform. Anyone who doesn't watch this regularly, Dave is full blind. He's like, no sight. He can't appreciate the beautiful view of, where the f*** was this? Portsmouth. <laughs> Don't worry, Dave, it's not the most attractive town. <laughs> I used to go to Portsmouth quite often. Uh, they had some like I used to be in the Navy cadets, and they had some like Navy sh there that we used to go to every year. I think there was a big boat. We used to stay on this boat. It was super hot and unpleasant. <laughs> I suppose it could have been worse. On the grand opening night, the Portsmouth mayor was stranded for several hours when the glass lift on the outside of the edifice failed and he had to be rescued. While these failings definitely highlight the consequences of employing inferior contractors, the unintended consequences of the skyscraper known as the Shard. Oh yeah, this is about the sh Oh, the Shard, located at 20 Fenchurch Street in London, were more interesting. Oh, sh is this the Shard? I must be conflating two things because I definitely heard about Fenchurch Street super recently maybe in a video about the walkie-talkie that was burning cars what's the unintended consequence of the shard doesn't everyone like the shard the shard quickly became an object of some irritation for many londoners apparently not the 38-story skyscraper built largely from glass is described as a dramatic edifice with curved exterior walls as anybody who went to school will probably know if you shine a bright light through concave glass it focuses that light into a very small and hot point although london isn't exactly known for its sunny weather it does put an appearance in occasionally and on one of those occasions um You're wrong, Dave! This isn't the shard, Dave! I'm getting my big brain out, Dave. Cause I just read the next line and it's about a melted Jaguar, which is definitely that mother walkie talkie 20 Fen Church, right? Church. It's a mother walkie talkie. Yes, man, it's the walkie-talkie. It's this, Dave, not the shard. Come on. We're supposed to be here doing facts, Dave. Am I supposed to carry this all on my back? You had one job, Dave. I'm just kidding, Dave. We all make mistakes. And this better be your last, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so the shards didn't melt a brand new Jaguar XJ belonging to Martin Lindsay, but the walkie-talkie building did, which is located at 20 Fenchurch Street. Lindsay said it's absolutely ruined before going on to secure his entry into the table of statements, which state the obvious by saying they've got to do something about it. It wasn't just cars that fell victim to London's new death ray. Several local businesses complained that the carpets had started smoldering, roofs had been damaged, and in one case, paving slabs outside a local restaurant had shattered under the heat. Given that the building was designed by architect Raphael Vignoli, who definitely didn't design the shard, or maybe he did, maybe he did that as well, he's been a busy boy. I don't think so though. Who I am told is held in high regard, uh, you would have thought that he may have considered the consequences of placing what is essentially a giant magnifying glass in the center of London. The building was later fitted with a sunshade on its south-facing side, which appears to have fixed the problem. Like I fixed the problem of your lack of facts in this entry, Dave. Disposable nappies. I had a mate. We had kids at exactly the same time. First kids born like, and, and we're good friends. Like me and my wife were friends with him and his wife. And they got pregnant exactly the same time as us. Had a kid like, I think it was four days after ours. First kid. And... They were like, yeah, yeah, well, disposable nappies are really bad for the environment. So we're going, we're doing the like washable nappies, which are apparently there's, there's like pieces of fabric, which people used to use in the past. I, you know, like in uh, like TV shows, you get that like, or like cartoons, the, the nappies held on or diapers are held on with like a pin, like a safety pin or whatever. And then you put them in the washing machine. And I'm like, yeah, f that. I'm not doing that. F the environment. I don't care. Like, that's not something I'm doing. About a week later, they were like, yeah, f disposable nappies. <laughs> Kids taking a sh it's not what you want.
You don't want that going through your washing machine. Even like when we first had kids, I swear to God, and my wife was like, I don't know. You, and she's like, I don't know what you're talking about. But all of my clothes for like two years smelled funny because you're putting in the washing machine, you know, there's like heavily soiled stuff from the kids. Like shit, piss, food, bogeys, whatever. And it goes in the washing machine and you put in all the powder and stuff, but the clothes come out, they still smell funny. And my clothes just smelled like funny children's smelly clothes for like two years. And now that they've stopped shitting in their clothes all the time, my clothes smell fine! If you're really old or want to have a go at reducing the amount of damage you cause to the environment, like my wife and I did for a while, oh sh**, Dave, you're one of these, okay! You may be aware of just how much of a pain in the ass non-disposable nappies, or diapers for those in the US, are to use. Seriously, for the first year of my child's life, I was unemployed, and because of this, I was what I believe is now called the primary caregiver. Whilst I will be eternally grateful for the time I got to spend with the aforementioned child, I certainly do not miss the horrendous process of washing reusable nappies, Dave, mate. J no, you sh**. How long did you do this for? My mates gave up after a week. And this was only five years ago. I had I had a comparatively easy. All I had to do was throw them in the washing machine, select the baby setting, and wait for a couple of hours. In the days before fancy new washing machines, boiling, mangling, and drying your baby's underwear must have felt like a full-time job. In 1948, Johnson & Johnson became the new best friend of mothers everywhere when they released the first disposable diaper in the United States. Although this was a single-use product, it still had to be worn underneath washable plastic pants. <laughs> the only one diapers that, are that, that used ultra-absorbent polymers would not really be widely used until the early 1980s wow i was born in like 87 so my parents were just about the right time and i don't know i wonder if we did use reusable nappies i don't think so i don't th I, I can I, my dad's similar enough to me to be like no thank you <laughs> i don't care about the environment that much and i have enough money to buy like the giant nappies are expensive though it's like I, I couldn't believe it. You just go into uh, you, the first few times. It's like going to the store, like buy a bunch of nappies, and he'd be checking out, and you'd be like, "Yo, what? Like, who is the what now? Like, nappies is one of those things. Like, you know, you know when you go into the supermarket, you buy salt. You're just not checking the price because you know salt's like 15p or something. I thought that would be the case with like nappies. It's like, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> I have no regrets though. Nappies rule. Although they were undoubtedly a time-saving marvel, it is unlikely that the original manufacturers stopped to consider the long-term effects of these largely non-biodegradable products, or if they did, many of the parents using them did not. I did not, Danny. I did not, Danny. 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 Uh, people are probably like, oh, Simon, the fact that you're, like, proud of this is, like, so shameful. You don't like the environment. It's like, I do like the environment fine, but no, I'm not, I'm not doing the, 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 no. I've talked about this enough. When I'm not doing that, and I'm not apologizing. By the time people began to wake up to the fact that roughly 5,000 nappies that each of their children would use would either have to be burnt or thrown into landfill sites where they would remain for hundreds of years, manufacturers were making so much money that nothing was likely to change anytime soon. In fact, they began to do their best to ensure that children remain in nappies for as long as possible. In 1999, Pampers-funded pediatrician T. Berry Brazelton told parents not to rush toilet training, and from then on, companies have been routinely making larger and larger sizes. <laughs> it is like, they'll just push that, they'll just push that. It's like, oh, so your kid's not potty trained yet. No, 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 but their voice is broken. They're 15. <laughs> Just carry on. <laughs> the money-making scheme appears to be working too. In 2017, a BBC article claimed that a survey by the Association of Teachers and Lecturers found that three quarters of teachers have seen an increase in the number of children who are starting school without being potty trained. Kids start school at what? Five? Six? Not potty trained by that? Both of my, my, my youngest kids too. He was potty trained at like... One, one and 1 1.8 it was before his, he was be, he was potty trained before his second birthday so the invention of this labor-saving device seems to have had at least two unintended consequences or at least unintended by the lady who is credited with the original invention valerie hunter gordon according to google 300 thousand disposable nappies are sent to landfill every minute i don't know i don't know how to check this but uh that seems it no no, 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 no. <laughs> One hour later. ChatGPT just doesn't connect recently. It pisses me off. Okay, I'm trying on my phone. Two 
hours later. ChatGPT, what's happening? This was happening yesterday. I need you. One eternity later. Hey, how many nappies are thrown away per minute globally? One million zillion jillion dillion cotillion times later. Your authentication token has expired. What the fuck is an authentication token? Oh, for f**k's sake, sign out and sign in again? I want to! I want to! I want to do that! Dave, I still don't believe it's true. Someone in the comments, use ChatGPT to figure this out, and I'll fix it for the next time, I promise. We need to get on with it. And secondly, manufacturers actively encourage parents to delay to toilet training to maximize profits. CFCs. There is no invention that... <laughs> Change the transportation, storage, and consumption of food quite like the refrigerator did. Nowadays, pretty much everybody has at least one of these cool devices in the house. Unfortunately, in the early days of home refrigeration, owning a fridge could be exceptionally detrimental to your health, especially if anything went wrong. You see, in order to keep these machines cold, some sort of coolant is required. Shocking. Oh, we know. In the early days, the chemicals of choice were usually sulfur dioxide, which is extremely damaging to the eyes and skin, or methyl formate, which is not only highly flammable, but also extremely toxic if inhales. <laughs> you could just die if your fridge leaks. <laughs> it's kind of terrifying. Obviously, as long as they were contained within a sealed coolant system, this was not a problem. Yeah, I mean, that's like, yeah, nuclear reactors are fine as long as they're sealed within their nuclear reactor thing. And it's like, yeah, but when they're not, it's real bad news. The problem arose if, for whatever reason, these chemicals escaped into the home. One of the people tasked with coming up with a less deadly cooling agent was Thomas Midgley, a chemist who worked for General Motors. Having already played a large part in the decimation of the environment when he invented leaded fuel, Midgley, who would also go on to be named as the most harmful inventor in history, would lead the team that eventually came up with a non-toxic, non-flammable refrigerator coolant called dichlorofluoromethane. The chemical, very for the chemical, the very first of the CFCs, would be sold under the brand name of Freon 12 and revolutionized the refrigeration industry. In time, yeah, Thomas Midgley's one of these dudes, it's like, he didn't add lead to gas for fun, it reduced something called knocking, which meant that engines weren't like blowing up all the time, and he found a non-toxic thing for fridges. The problem is, both of these inventions also had, like, they're really unintended consequences, the name of this video, that's how it works. Great job. In time, CFCs would catch on in a big way. Not only were they used for refrigeration, but also as the main propellant in aerosol cans. It's perhaps a little unfair that Midgley takes all of the blame for this, because unlike his idea of leaded fuel, there was no way he could have known exactly how much damage his latest invention would cause. So, what was the problem? Well, as we now know, CFCs are exceptionally detrimental to the environment. More specifically, their astronomical usage over the years is almost entirely responsible for the huge hole in the ozone layer, which was detected in 1985. Once the damage and the cause of the damage had been established, the United Nations, along with 45 other countries, moved with remarkable swiftness to ban the use of CFCs. In 1987, the Montreal Protocol was signed, and as a direct result of the reduction of these chemicals, the hole in the ozone layer is believed to be shrinking. So, next time you crack open a cold beer, enjoy milk that you've owned for more than two days, or help yourself to a glass full of ice, spare a quick thought for just what exactly it cost in environmental damage for us to enjoy this now ubiquitous amenity. Dave. It's healing. The hole's going away. F worth it. Like, okay, f it. We'll kill all the cats and put some rabbits there. Wait, why did they put the fucking rabbits there? 